accordingly. It is the judgment of the law and the sentence of the court that for the premeditated murder of Seth Jackson, you, Michael Shane Bargo, are sentenced to death. Michael Bargo. In the quiet town of Ocala, Florida, a shocking crime would soon rock the community to its core. The victim at the center of this tragedy was Seath Jackson, a 15-year-old boy with dreams and aspirations like any other teenager. But behind the facade of a seemingly ordinary life, a toxic web of relationships and simmering tensions would lead to his untimely demise. Seath had recently gone through a tumultuous breakup with his girlfriend, Amber Wright. Rumors of infidelity and a toxic atmosphere surrounded their relationship, fueling the flames of resentment and jealousy. It was during this time that Michael Bargo, an 18-year-old whom Seath suspected of having cheated with Amber, developed an intense hatred for Seath, wrongly believing that he had abused Amber. This toxic triangle of emotions would soon set the stage for a horrifying sequence of events. Undeterred by their failed attempt to confront Seath, Bargo and his co-conspirators hatched a sinister plan to exact their revenge. Amber Wright, still entangled in the web of toxic emotions, became a crucial player in this deadly game. Bargo convinced Amber to lure Seath to a trailer promising a chance to work things out. Unbeknownst to Seath, this invitation would lead him straight into the heart of darkness. As Seath stepped into the trailer, he was ambushed by a group of teenagers, including Amber Wright, Michael Bargo, Kyle Hooper, Justin Soto, and Charlie Ely. Seath was mercilessly beaten, his pleas for mercy falling on deaf ears. Bargo, fueled by his intense hatred, fired multiple shots at Seath, sealing his tragic fate. The young life of Seath Jackson was extinguished in a moment of unimaginable cruelty. It was Kyle Hooper, one of the co-conspirators in Seath's murder who would break the silence. Overwhelmed by guilt and the weight of his actions, he confessed to his mother after seeing a news report about Seath's disappearance. With Kyle's confession, the wheels of justice began to turn. The police swiftly apprehended the individuals involved in Seath's murder, including Amber Wright, Michael Bargo, Justin Soto, and Charlie Ely. The truth behind the heinous crime was about to be exposed. The investigation into Seath's murder was a race against time, as detectives worked tirelessly to uncover the chilling details of the crime. The crime scene told a gruesome tale of violence and brutality, and the remnants of a fire pit revealed the horrifying fate that befell Seath's body. The trial for the murder of Seath Jackson gripped the community of Ocala, Florida, as the defendants faced the consequences of their heinous actions. Amber Wright, Michael Bargo, Justin Soto, and Charlie Ely were tried separately as adults, each facing their day in court. The prosecution presented a compelling case, meticulously outlining the chilling details of the crime. The sentencing phase of the trial brought forth a range of emotions. The jury, having found Michael Bargo to be the instigator of the crime, recommended the ultimate punishment, the death penalty. Accordingly, it is the judgment of the law and the sentence of the court that for the premeditated murder of Seth Jackson, you, Michael Shane Bargo, are sentenced to death. The other defendants, Amber Wright, Justin Soto, and Charlie Ely, received life sentences for their roles in Seath's murder. The community grappled with the weight of these sentences, trying to make sense of the senseless violence that had unfolded in their midst. A teenage killer officially sentenced to death. A judge agreed with a Warren County jury which sentenced 19-year-old Austin Myers to death. Let's head to Warren County Court, where the case of Austin Myers is being presided upon. Myers, along with his accomplice, were convicted for their roles in the chilling murder of Justin Back. Take a seat in the courtroom as we examine the evidence, the motives behind the murder, and the disturbing aftermath that followed. In the quiet town of Waynesville, Ohio, two young boys formed a friendship that would ultimately lead to a horrifying tragedy. Austin Myers and Justin Back were inseparable during their middle school years, attending the the same high school and sharing countless adventures together. Their bond seemed unbreakable as they navigated the challenges of adolescence side by side. Unfortunately, Myers, who wanted a quick way of getting money, approached Timothy Mosley, another acquaintance from their school days, with an enticing proposition on how to make money. Myers knew that Back's stepfather, Mark Cates, had a safe in their family home, rumored to contain a substantial amount of money. Myers believed that Cates kept around $20,000 in the safe, a fortune that could change their lives forever. Myers, driven by a dangerous combination of greed and desperation, hatched a plan to burglarize Back's family home and steal the coveted safe. In preparation for their heinous act, Myers and Mosley embarked on a shopping spree, acquiring the tools they believed would ensure their success. They purchased septic enzymes, ammonia, septic tank cleaner, and rubber gloves, all to erase any trace of their presence at crime scene. Armed with a six-inch pocket knife and a garrote, the two made their way to Back's horse, where he was viciously attacked and stabbed to death multiple times. 
crimes. The duo then searched the house until they discovered the safe tucked away in a closet. Once they retrieved it, Myers and Mosley attempted to clean up the crime scene using the ammonia and other materials they had purchased. They wrapped Back's lifeless body in a blanket, a macabre attempt to conceal the horror they had unleashed. The duo discarded the body along with Back's laptop in an attempt to erase any evidence of the crime. Returning to Mosley's house, they set their sights on the safe, but their hopes were shattered as they cracked open the safe, only to find disappointment. Instead of the promised fortune, they discovered paperwork, loose change, bullets, and other random items. In a desperate attempt to erase any remaining evidence, Myers and Mosley burned the papers, trash bags containing evidence of the crime, and their blood-soaked clothes in a fire pit in the backyard. Mark Cates, Back's stepfather, returned home from work, only to discover that his safe and handgun were missing. Cates and his wife contacted the police as their attempts to reach him were in vain, since his cell phone had been left behind in the house. The investigation began, and officers soon received reports of a suspicious vehicle seen outside Back's home, matching the description of Meyer's car. The pieces of the puzzle were slowly falling into place. With the assistance of Clayton Police, they located the car and detained Myers at Mosley's house. Detectives interviewed Myers at the Clayton Police Station, where he vehemently denied any involvement in Back's disappearance or the burglary, but the weight of the evidence against him was insurmountable. Myers was taken back to Mosley's house, while Mosley himself was brought in for questioning. In a shocking turn of events, Myers eventually admitted to being present when Mosley stabbed Back. He claimed ignorance of Mosley's intentions, professing his shock and disbelief at the violence that unfolded. But the walls were closing in, and Mosley overheard Myers implicating him alone for the murder. Faced with the betrayal of his former friend, Mosley confessed to the crime, implicating Myers in the planning of the burglary. The trial of Austin Myers and Timothy Mosley gripped the nation as the community sought justice for the heinous murder of Justin Back. As the trial commenced, the stark contrast between Myers and Mosley became apparent. Mosley, the one who had wielded the knife that ended Back's life, had struck a plea bargain. In exchange for his cooperation and a guilty plea, he received a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. On the other hand, Myers, who had played a role in planning the burglary and had been present during the murder, faced a different fate. The prosecution sought the ultimate penalty, pushing for the death sentence. Finally, the moment arrived when the jury delivered their verdict. Austin Myers, at the age of 19, became the youngest inmate on death row in Ohio. Surprisingly, Myers showed no emotions as he learned his very severe punishment. Next, we head to Harris County Criminal Justice Center in Texas, where a dramatic scene unfolds. It involves the case of Dexter Johnson, a teenager who has been sentenced to death for a heinous crime. Brace yourself as we discuss the crime Dexter Johnson committed, his sentencing, and most importantly, his reaction to his sentencing. In the quiet town of Harris County, a horrifying crime unfolded that would forever change the lives of those involved. It all started in 2006 when Dexter Johnson, a young man just 18 years old, became entangled in a web of darkness and violence. Johnson, along with four other teenagers, embarked on a crime spree that would leave a trail of devastation in its wake. One fateful evening, Johnson and his accomplices spotted their targets, Maria Aparis, a 23-year-old woman, and Hoi Ngo, a 17-year-old boy. The couple was sitting in Maria's car outside Ngo's house, unaware of the danger that lurked nearby. In a matter of seconds, Johnson and his group forced their way inside, overpowering the unsuspecting couple. Fear and panic filled the air as Maria and Hui realized they were at the mercy of these ruthless criminals. The car Jacking quickly escalated into something far more sinister. Johnson and his accomplices had no intention of simply stealing the car and fleeing the scene. Forcing Marie and Hui into the back seat, Johnson and his gang drove them to a secluded area, far away from prying eyes. Johnson, driven by a twisted desire for power and control, subjected Maria to a brutal and degrading act of sexual abuse. In a chilling display of cold-bloodedness, Johnson and another teen pulled out their weapons and aimed them at the terrified couple. Without a second thought, they pulled the trigger ending the lives of Maria and Hui in an instant. The murders committed by Dexter Johnson and his accomplices were not isolated incidents. They were part of a 25-day crime spree that terrorized the community. Three other slayings were attributed to Johnson and his gang, leaving a trail of devastation in their wake. The weight of the evidence against Johnson was overwhelming, and it was clear that he needed to be held accountable for his actions. The trial that followed was a highly publicized event, with the eyes of the nation fixed on Harris County. The prosecution presented a compelling case, painting Johnson as a cold-blooded killer who showed no remorse for his heinous acts. The jury, after carefully considering the evidence presented, reached a verdict. Dexter Johnson was found guilty of the double murder and sentenced to death. Dexter Darnell Johnson, the jury has found you guilty of capital murder. In accordance with the laws of the state of Texas, this court hereby assesses your punishment of death. 
he was sentenced to death, a punishment deemed fitting for the unimaginable horrors he had inflicted upon his victims. Following the court's verdict, the courtroom erupted in a mix of shock, grief, and anger. Johnson's family erupted into sorrow, loud sobs and screams disrupting the court proceedings. Johnson, on the other hand, was livid with the jury's verdict, and in a shocking and remorseless move, lunged at the victim's family, trying to attack them. Following his actions, pandemonium broke out in the courtroom with several officers rushing to surround Johnson, while others tried to keep the gallery at bay. Overall, Johnson didn't seem too pleased with his punishment, even though he had brutally ended the lives of several others. Take a seat at the District Court of Oklahoma County, where Sean Sellers is about to be sentenced. This case, which combined elements of murder, satanic rituals, and a controversial trial, held the attention of the nation. Sean Sellers, a young man from Oklahoma, committed a series of brutal murders that would forever change his life. Sit back as we explore the shocking details of Sellers' crimes, his trial, and his ultimate fate. In the dark and twisted world of crime, some cases stand out for their sheer brutality and shocking nature. The case of Sean Sellers is one such example. Born on May 18, 1969 in Corcoran, California, Sellers would go on to commit a series of heinous crimes that would forever stain his name in the annals of criminal history. It all began on that fateful day in September 1985, when Sellers, just 16 years old at the time, embarked on a path of destruction that would claim the lives of three innocent individuals. His first victims were his own mother, Vonda Belafato, and his stepfather, Lee Belafato. With a handgun in his hand, he carefully aimed and fired, first shooting his stepfather and then his mother, who awoke to the sound of the gunshot. Sellers showed no mercy as he shot her in the face, extinguishing her life in an instant. But Sellers' murderous rampage didn't end there. He later confessed to another killing that had taken place in 1985, just months before the murder of his parents. This time, his victim was Robert Paul Bauer, a 32-year-old Circle K convenience store clerk. The motive behind this senseless act of violence? Bauer had refused to sell Sellers beer, and in a fit of rage, Sellers decided to take matters into his own hands. Armed with a handgun, he confronted Bauer at the store and callously ended his life. What makes Sellers' crimes all the more shocking is the motive behind them. At his trial, Sellers claimed to be a practicing Satanist at the time of the murders. He professed that he was under the influence of demonic possession, specifically by a demon named Ezurate, which compelled him to commit these heinous acts. In later documents, Sellers revealed that he had immersed himself in the teachings of the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey, reading it hundreds of times between the ages of 15 and 16. He believed that Satanism offered him an honest way to live and that its rituals would grant him control over his life. Despite Sellers' claims of demonic possession and his alleged addiction to Satanism, the jury refused to consider these factors. They found him guilty of multiple homicides and sentenced him to death in 1986. At the time, Oklahoma law did not allow for life sentences without the possibility of parole, leaving the jury with no choice but to opt for the death penalty. Despite the pleas for mercy, Sellers' fate was sealed. However, he seemed to have made peace with the fact that he was sentenced to die. I don't care if they kill me. I don't care if I live to be a thousand years old. I will never be what I was before. Next, we head to the 17th Judicial Circuit Court in Florida, where a trial that shook the nation to its core is about to end. The case revolves around the horrifying Parkland High School shooting committed by Nicholas Cruz. Take a seat in the courtroom as we uncover the unbelievable facts surrounding this tragic event and Cruz's reaction to his sentence. To understand the shocking events that unfolded on that tragic day, we must first delve into the troubled background of Nicholas Cruz. Born on September 24, 1998, in Margate, Florida, Cruz's early life was marred by a series of behavioral problems and disturbing tendencies that would eventually culminate in one of the deadliest school shootings in American history. Growing up, Cruz faced a tumultuous upbringing. His parents divorced when he was just a child, leaving him to navigate the complexities of life with a fractured family. As he entered his teenage years, it became apparent that Cruz was struggling with his mental health. Cruz's behavioral problems soon caught the attention of school authorities. He attended Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, where his erratic and disruptive behavior became a cause for concern among teachers 
professors and fellow students alike. But it wasn't just his behavior at school that raised eyebrows. Cruz's online presence painted a chilling picture of his troubled mind. He frequently posted disturbing content on social media platforms, expressing his racist, anti-Semitic, and xenophobic views. His obsession with mass shootings became increasingly evident as he idolized infamous perpetrators of such heinous acts. On February 14th, 2018, the day that would forever be etched in the collective memory of Parkland, Florida, Cruz arrived at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School armed with a semi-automatic rifle. What followed was a scene of unimaginable terror as he indiscriminately opened fire on students and faculty members, leaving a trail of devastation in his wake. The Parkland High School shooting would claim the lives of 17 innocent people and leave 17 others injured. The shockwaves of this senseless act reverberated across the nation as the community grappled with the unimaginable loss and the urgent need for answers. The tragedy of the Parkland shooting would not only expose the failures of the school system and law enforcement to address Cruz's alarming behavior, but it would also ignite a national conversation about the urgent need for improved mental health support and stricter gun control measures. As the nation grappled with the aftermath of the Parkland High School shooting, the legal process began to unfold. Nicholas Cruz, the perpetrator of this heinous act, would face a trial that would determine his fate. The courtroom became the stage for a deeply divisive and emotionally charged debate as the shocking details of Cruz's actions were laid bare for all to see. The trial was marked by intense scrutiny of Cruz's mental health. Defense attorneys argued that he suffered from a range of psychological disorders, including depression, anxiety, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. They painted a picture of a troubled young man who had fallen through the cracks of a system ill-equipped to address his needs. On the other side, the prosecution sought to hold Cruz accountable for his actions, arguing that his mental health issues did not absolve him of responsibility. They presented evidence of his meticulous planning, his online posts glorifying violence, and his disturbing fascination with mass shootings. They painted a picture of a calculated and cold-blooded killer. The jury, comprised of 12 individuals tasked with the weighty responsibility of delivering a verdict, listened intently to the arguments presented by both sides. After weeks of deliberation, the jury reached a unanimous decision. Nicholas Cruz was found guilty on all 34 counts. The debate over whether Cruz should receive the death penalty became a central point of contention. Count one of the indictment, the murder in the first degree of Luke Hoyer, the court imposes a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. In the end, the judge handed down a sentence that would ensure Cruz would spend the rest of his life behind bars, 34 consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. While some may argue that this sentence is synonymous with a death sentence, as Cruz will never experience freedom again, others believe that it is not a fitting punishment for the magnitude of his crimes. Wade's trial began in May of this year. It was May 20th that a jury found him guilty on all charges. The sentence today, Wade was given 172 and a half years in prison. Next, we head to a Franklin County courtroom where 17-year-old Jordan Wade is about to be sentenced. The teenager was to be sentenced after pleading guilty to the gruesome murders of four people and trying to kill a fifth victim during an armed robbery at an East Hudson Street home in June 2013. Take a seat in the courtroom as we uncover the chilling details of this crime. South Linden was a quiet suburban neighborhood where families lived peacefully and children played in the streets. But on that fateful day on June 13th, 2015, everything changed. Jordan Wade, a seemingly ordinary teenager, committed a crime so heinous that it sent shockwaves through the community and the nation. Jordan Wade was just 16 years old when he embarked on a path of destruction that would forever alter the lives of those involved. Along with his 27-year-old co-defendant Robert Adams, Wade broke into a home in a robbery attempt. But instead of ending things that way, after robbing the victims, the duo ordered them to the basement where they were all shot. Unfortunately for Wade, the fifth victim a 15-year-old girl was able to survive the shooting and called the police to the scene. By the time they arrived, four other people were found dead with multiple gunshot wounds. As news of the quadruple murder spread, the community was gripped with fear and disbelief. Law enforcement agencies launched a massive investigation, leaving no stone unturned in their quest for justice. The evidence was overwhelming, and it didn't take long for the authorities to identify Jordan Wade as the prime suspect. The trial of Jordan Wade was one of the most high-profile cases in recent memory. The courtroom was packed with 
spectators, eager to witness justice being served. The prosecution presented a mountain of evidence, including DNA, fingerprints, and eyewitness testimonies, all pointing to Jordan Wade and Adams as the perpetrators. However, it was revealed that Adams was the one who pulled the trigger. After a lengthy trial, Jordan Wade was found guilty on all counts of aggravated murder. The judge, taking into account the severity of the crime and the loss of innocent lives, handed down a sentence that shocked the nation. Jordan Wade was sentenced to 172 and a half years to life in prison. Yes, you heard that right, 172 and a half years to life. Since he was too young to get the death sentence, 172 years in prison was deemed a sentence that ensured he would spend the rest of his natural life behind bars, never to see the light of day again. Wade displayed no emotions at all as the judge read out his sentence. The sentencing sent shockwaves through the community and sparked a nationwide debate on the appropriate punishment for such heinous crimes committed by juveniles. Some argued that the sentence was too harsh for a teenager, while others believed it was a necessary measure to ensure justice for the victims and their families. Finally, we make our way to a Providence courtroom where Russell Burrell is about to be sentenced. Charged with three counts of murder, three counts of unlawful use of a firearm, and conspiracy, Burrell was convicted in a triple murder case, and now his fate hangs in the balance as he awaits his sentencing. Take a seat in the courtroom as we explore the shocking journey of Russell Burrell, a teenager reacting to a death sentence. It was the summer of 2012 when the lives of Shamika Barros, Michael Martin, and Damien Colon were tragically cut short. They were three innocent individuals living in a quiet apartment complex, unaware of the danger that lurked just around the corner. Russell Burrell, a troubled teenager with a troubled past, had fallen in with the wrong crowd. Desperate for money and a taste of the fast life, Burrell found himself entangled in a web of criminal activity. Burrell's involvement in the triple homicide was part of a robbery gone wrong. Alongside three other men, Burrell embarked on a fateful night that would forever change the lives of everyone involved. It was a warm summer evening when Burrell and his accomplices decided to target the apartment where Barros, Martin, and Colin resided. Their plan was simple break in, steal whatever valuables they could find, and make a quick getaway. Little did they know, their actions would unleash a wave of violence and devastation that would reverberate throughout the community. On that fateful night, Burl and his accomplices approached the apartment complex under the cover of darkness. Armed with firearms, they entered the building to carry out their nefarious plan. Inside the apartment, Barros, Martin, and Colin were unsuspecting victims going about their daily lives. They had no idea that danger lurked just outside their door. As Burl and his accomplices burst into the apartment, chaos ensued. The victims were caught off guard, their lives hanging in the balance as the perpetrators unleashed a hail of gunfire. The scene was one of sheer terror and confusion. Barros, Martin, and Colin fought for their lives, but the odds were stacked against them. In the end, their valiant efforts were in vain as they succumbed to the senseless violence. The news of the triple homicide sent shockwaves throughout Providence. Residents were gripped with fear and disbelief, struggling to comprehend the senseless act of violence that had unfolded in their midst. As the investigation unfolded, the police quickly identified Russell Burrell and his three accomplices as the prime suspects. The trial that followed would reveal the shocking details of the crime and the extent of Burrell's involvement. The prosecution wasted no time in laying out a compelling case against Burrell. They presented a wealth of evidence, including eyewitness testimonies, forensic analysis, and surveillance footage that placed Burrell at the scene of the crime. As the trial drew to a close, the jury was left with the weighty task of determining Burrell's fate. After careful deliberation, they returned turned with a verdict, guilty on all counts. Killer sentenced. Another defendant learns his punishment for a Providence triple homicide. Russell Burrell is ordered to serve six life sentences plus 10 years in prison. The judge, in delivering the sentence, acknowledged the severity of the crimes committed by Burrell. He handed down six life sentences, with four to be served consecutively and two concurrently, along with an additional 10 years in prison. Unless he was immortal, Burrell's fate was sealed. Throughout the sentencing hearing, Burrell showed no remorse or even any emotion at the prospect of spending a lifetime behind bars. As we come to the end of this gripping on seven teenagers reacting to death sentences, we reflect on the harrowing events surrounding the crimes they committed with a renewed commitment to creating a safer environment for young individuals. For more fascinating videos like this, click on the card showing on your screens and I'll be waiting on the other side.